All right, it's one o'clock. Let's get started. Hi, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Minnesota Astronomical Society's uh, Beginner Special Interest Group uh, virtual presentation. Uh, today's presentation is by Mike Shaw. He's going to present on photographing the total solar eclipse that's coming up uh, fairly quickly now uh, on April 8th. Uh, Mike is a phenomenal uh, landscape astro imager. Uh, he's, you know, I've kind of followed his career as it were, as he's been doing this over the past few years and uh, getting better and better at this, at this sub subject. He teaches classes uh, that, uh, that people can join uh, on uh, various aspects of astro imaging and they also travel. Um, I know he's traveled around the country and I believe, I think I read that Mike, are you setting up to travel internationally? I think I thought I saw that somewhere. Yeah, heading to Norway next month. Yeah, how awesome is that? So I don't want to hold him up. I know he's got a lot to talk about. So without much further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Mike. Just one thing I should add is please turn off your cameras uh, for bandwidth purposes. And also, if you have a question, please put it in the chat. And then when Mike uh, pauses, I will ask the questions for you. That way it keeps Mike's flow going and with little interruption. So with that, here's Mike Shaw. Well, thanks so much, Suresh, uh, and welcome everyone to the uh, presentation this afternoon. Super excited to be here. It's always great to present to a group of astronomers and astrophotographers and photographers. And so really, the uh, I'll just go ahead and start here with um, with things. So the this is a, a, a speeded up video of the 2017 eclipse from the, <laughs> the, the, the ground level uh, point of view. And... The purpose of today's talk really is to help introduce you to some of the aspects of an eclipse and how to photograph them. And there's a little bit of something here. This is me studying my plan. Is it everything? I think it's right. I hope it's right. Checking everything, checking it twice. Things are starting to get dark. Things are starting to get a little bit cool. Might be time to put on my, up. Oh, is that, oh, what's, okay, I think that looks good. Count my eclipse glasses. It'll be time to, up. Oh, double checking it. There it is. And... It's getting cold. Here comes the coat. Um, you might notice the the breeze starting to pick up on the lake and the and the um, uh, here comes the filter. Oh, here we go! Boom! There it is. There it is. And then all too quickly, it is going to disappear. And it's get ready for twenty twenty four. So, you know, a lot of stuff's happening right there. And I want to go through, I've got, as you can see, three cameras, three different uh, sets of projects going on, a lot of things happening. So I'm just going to kind of go through those things. And starting with this, I mean, this is a close-up shot, close-up image of the eclipsed sun. We can't see the sun right now because the moon's in front of it. We're not looking at the sun per se. We're looking at the moon uh, behind which is the sun. And of course, we can see the beautiful corona coming out of the sun and uh, that's a whole subject of things to talk about. So we have that. Uh, I'm going to be talking about multi-image projects like this one. We have both diamond rings along with an image at totality. So we have multi-image, uh, you know, close-up, you know, close-up multi-image projects that you can consider for your eclipse day. We can have multi-image <laughs> telephoto projects that include the partial phases in addition to uh, maximum, you know, totality. So there's a bunch of, and you've seen different arrangements of these in circles and in a row like this and all kinds of different things. Uh, and then this is a wide angle shot. So this is showing the uh, maximum uh, totality. So you can see the eclipse sun, kind of, but you can also see the foreground. This is in uh, Grand Tetons National Park. This is Grand Teton. Uh, that's this mountain right here. This is a place called Lake Solitude. And it was pretty solitary there. It was a nine mile hike. I had to leave my campsite at two in the morning, had to have a mono, a mono with a moose, get the moose out of the way, hiked up, um, got everything set up. It was a beautiful thing. Uh, along these lines, you can also consider multi-image wide angle shots like this one that shows the sequence of the eclipse progressing. You can see um, the partial phases starting to kick in along with the, uh, the fully eclipsed sun. And this is a wider angle view. This is that third uh, camera that you saw a moment ago. And this is a wide angle shot at totality. You can see how dark it is. You can almost uh, see, you can see um, some other objects up in the sky here. And uh, you can do a sequence with a wide angle lens and then you can get super creative. And this particular shot, uh, you can see the stars. It's kind of a fanciful imaginatory um, uh, interpretation, if you will. 
And to get this shot, do I have the sequence? No, I know I'm going to get into that a little bit later. But this is um, a combination of shots, as you can see, many shots, one of which is taken at night, the same night as the eclipse, but without having moved the tripod. So I basically stayed here uh, late into the evening, <laughs> overnight, in fact. Uh, I slept literally on a on a rock because uh, um, I had no tent or a sleeping bag. And I took the image from night and I blended it in with this one. So those are just a few of the different um, projects that you can consider. And these are the same uh, suite of projects, if you will, lined up with the three tripods you saw from the video at the beginning. So on the left, we had a 24 millimeter wide angle lens in a vertical orientation, a portrait orientation. In the middle is a 14 millimeter lens in a landscape orientation. And then on the far right is a telephoto lens, which is attached to a very small portable star tracker. I don't know if you can see it with my mouse here. It's the Polari star tracker. And that's got a 200 millimeter lens with a 1.7 X teleconverter. So those are the three projects that, you know, just provide kind of a, a starting point for a discussion. I kind of like to organize things like this. So if you think of, and these are the images we're going to be talking about today, the image projects we'll talk, be talking about today. So we have uh, single image shots, basically, which are just a single snap of the shutter. And we can partition those into wide angle, um, wide angle projects and then telephoto projects. And then you can have multi-image composites or blends where you take many different images and combine them using Photoshop or other types of programs into a, a single image. We're gonna talk about all of this stuff today in quite a bit of detail. And so, like I said, the, the goal today is to just maybe motivate you or inspire you to think about some different type of projects that you might like to consider undertaking uh, this coming April. Uh, by all means, uh, by no means do you, <laughs> is, we're gonna be covering a lot of stuff and a lot of this might seem a little bit detailed and down in the weeds, but then again, that might be the sort of thing that uh, gets you going. So um, uh, that's uh, that's kind of where we're starting from. And I was talking to Suresh beforehand, and really one of the things that we wanted to emphasize is that uh, in a lot of ways, this really is a once in a lifetime opportunity to be able to see this right from uh, the continental United States. So I'll come back to that from time to time. But here's the outline. So there's a lot of stuff as you can see. I'm gonna I'm not gonna read this here, but this is kind of our, our uh, menu for today. And the first thing, of course, we wanna start off with is eclipse safety. And uh, as you, I'm sure you all know, you absolutely can't look at the sun without solar goggles. And this these aren't sunglasses. These are made out of a special metalized film that not only block a lot of the light, but these, uh, this metal film also blocks the ultraviolet and the infrared light coming out of the sun. So it's very safe to look at the sun through these uh, solar goggles, but it's not safe to look at them without them. So please don't look at the sun. Uh, you won't feel any pain and you could really hurt your eyes. And also you can see here is uh, under no circumstance with the telephoto lens, is it safe to look through uh, this, uh, your optical viewfinder at the sun? Uh, because it's it's constant, it's basically a giant magnifying glass and you're looking at the sun through a magnifying glass. So don't do that. And you don't really want to use your live view uh, on your camera without the solar filter either, because then you're just focusing the magnifying glass on on your camera sensor. And uh, if you ever want to, if you have, if you're bored for a few minutes and you want to be enter you know, entertained at someone else's expense, I guess, you can Google, you know, what happened after the 2017 eclipse where people did this. And you can see some beautiful examples of melted sensors and that sort of thing. So uh, you just be aware of the fact that you really want to make sure that you are uh, protecting your, uh, your yourself, your eyes, and your camera. Uh, part of the reason is that you can, the damage is permanent and you won't feel anything. It's not like you'll feel any sensation warning you about the, uh, the damage that's happening. So this is an example. I have several of these to show at uh, different times. Uh, when we get to this part of the gear, uh, the gear part of the talk. But as you can see, they're just, it's a very thin, flexible, it's not a, uh, it's a metalized piece of mylar, basically. And uh, when you, if, if you do buy a filter that screws into your lens, one idea would be, as you can see in the bottom left, is to get the biggest one you possibly can and then get step down rings for your other lenses. So you don't have to buy a small one for your small lens and a big one for your big lens. Just buy all big lens, all big filters and then use these step down rings. And then on the right, you can see my beautiful adaptation of a telescope filter for my wide angle 
of uh, zoom lens. So yeah, we'll be talking about that a little bit later, but that's what these things look like. And just to be clear about the effect of these solar filters on your photography, when you, this is an image out on, from my backyard back from 2017 uh, with the solar filter off. And then immediately after I took this photograph, I put my solar filter on and took this photograph. And that's the sun, that little orange dot right there. If you look just to the right of the screen where my, where my mouse is, you might be able to see a little bit of gray. This is the light that was leaking in around my, and then a little bit here on the left, this is sunlight that's leaking in around the filter. So I had to fix that. But that's what uh, the shots look like with a solar filter off. And that's what they look like when well, you can't see the sun at all because it's so bright. And now you can see the sun perfectly, but you can't see anything else because it's so dim. And that's why we get into the uh, compositing techniques that we're going to be talking about a little bit later on and throughout the talk. So really the first thing then is um, safety first, safety first, safety first. Just make sure it's a, a solar filter. It's not a neutral density filter. Neutral density filters really aren't the right thing for this because they don't block the uh, infrared uh, and the UV light. All right, let's briefly, I know this is an astronomical society, so... Um, what can I say? But it's always good to start with the start at the beginning, as they say. And a solar eclipse occurs when the moon lies between the sun and the earth. And the shadow of the moon um, actually uh, covers part of the earth's surface, as you can see in the actual photograph on the lower left. And, you know, this is relatively rare because the moon's orbit is inclined at about five degrees to the earth's orbit around the sun. So this doesn't happen as often as you might think, but it happens often enough for it to be exciting. And when this occurs, if you look very closely at the region between the moon and the sun, there's the part of the direct shadow. That's this, whoops, that's this part right here. This really you know, dark shadowed part is called the umbra. And then you can see these white dash lines that you can have a partial, uh, the, the part of the earth's shadow hits the earth. And within that region, you have a partial eclipse and that is called the penumbra. Um, and so we have the umbra, which is where the action is, and then the penumbra, where we have the partial uh, eclipse. And then outside of the penumbra, we have no eclipse at all. And the thing that you want to bear in mind is if, if you're just, if this is like your first eclipse, or you're just thinking about the eclipse or talking to your family and your friends about this, the umbra is where you see totality, which is, you can see by this eclipsed sun. In the penumbra, you don't see that at all. All you see is a partial eclipse, which is cool, admittedly, but you got to get to the path of totality. And the way that, what that looks like if we zoom in is the path of totality is this red strip that I've highlighted on this map. It goes through Ohio, it goes through Texas, it goes all the way up into Maine, passes through New York. Buffalo's right on the center line of this path of totality. And as the eclipse progresses, as you'll see, Totality only lasts for a few short minutes, but outside of the path of totality, totality doesn't happen at all. And it's it's very sad. So you want to make sure you get to the path. Of, I've had a couple of conversations, even in the last couple of days with people who are saying, yeah, well, I'm going to get to like 90% 90, 90 totality. I think that should be pretty good. And it's just not the same at all. Let me give you a demonstration for this. So this is a speeded up simulation of uh, the total solar eclipse from, I believe this is from Buffalo, New York. So I, I uh, told the program, this is Stellarium, we'll be talking about it. I told the program that I'm, I'm going to be in Buffalo, New York. What's the eclipse going to look like? And you can see the partial eclipse. We're in the penumbra right now. We haven't, the the, the umbral shadow hasn't arrived. All of a sudden, there it is. And it's gone. It's over. And that's it. That's literally, I mean, this is speeded up, but it doesn't, like I say, it only lasts for a few minutes and then it's over. And in comparison, on the left, uh, we have Buffalo, and on the right, we have Minneapolis. doesn't even happen in Minneapolis at all. I mean, you completely miss it. So it's really, really imperative to, um, of course, I want to emphasize this is a simulation. So who knows what the actual corona is going to look like on the day. Um, but it's it's really absolutely vital that you get into the path of totality, because outside of that path, you're faced with the situation that you have on the right, where you just have a, a nice partial eclipse, but you miss totality altogether. All right, so uh, I think I've made my sales pitch for getting to the path of totality. You can look that up. Um, do I have a, uh, let me talk to, uh, briefly about terminology and then I'll show, did I give a link of where to look that up? No, I haven't yet. Okay, I'm gonna give you a link of where to look that up for your interest. 
in this case, just FYI, the you know the moon and the sun are kind of in relative motion to one another. Maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't. And what causes the eclipse to occur and then end is the moon is actually moving relative to the sun, as you just saw. And so that's what this really looks like. A couple of, uh, actually five important bits of terminology that you're going to want to know are we have first contact, second contact, maximum totality, third contact, and fourth contact. So first contact is, as you can imagine, C1 is when the moon first touches the sun. The two disks touch. Second contact is when, and I've kind of exaggerated this, there's really no crescent sun left at this. Second contact is when the moon first completely covers up the sun. Between second contact and third contact is when the total eclipse takes place. And as I say, it only lasts for a few minutes. And then between third contact, whoops, and fourth contact, we have, between third and fourth contact, we have the ending of the eclipse, the partial phases. In terms of a schematic timeline, which is not really to scale, this is how things happen as we go from left to right. Uh, first contact, whoa, oh man. Um, first contact, uh, the eclipse happens. A lot of stuff happens right in the middle. And the fourth contact, uh, everything's kind of over. From an Oh, and here's where you can look this up. Okay, so you can scan this QR code. And I know that this is a recorded... Um, recorded presentation. So I have a few of these QR codes I'll be presenting today. And if you miss any of them, you can always go back and look at the recording that uh, Suresh will be providing and, uh, and, and rescan them. But if you go to this timeanddate.com website and zoom in on this map and kind of poke around, you can pretty quickly find out where you uh, want to be. And again, even if you're in the path of totality, you really want to be at the center of the path of totality along with the rest of North America. So that's something to think about. Uh, so, for example, in Dallas, Texas, which is a pretty good location, you can see that the first contact, which is this thing over here, that happens at 1223. And then look at this. C2 to C3 is only four minutes, and then the whole thing's over at three o'clock. So when you're starting to consider your plans for the eclipse, what's really going to happen for you is the first place I started is to look up these times and write them down so you have a, a reference point. Um approximately to scale, this is how things look for Dallas, Texas. Uh, the first uh, the first bite out of the sun takes place at 1223. I've written it down here. And then a whole bunch of stuff happens right here in the middle. And from um, a, a, you know, a, what's, what do you, what, what are you doing during all of this? The, the, the part that I've indicated in yellow is when this partial eclipse is, is happening. And then we have the part in the middle where we have the total eclipse. And um, the adrenaline level goes something like this. I mean, at the you know the early morning and the late afternoon, everything's fine. It's all good. We're gonna have a great day. Things are starting to amp up, and then I have this like red line right in the middle of the, of the uh, eclipse day, which is a lot of fun, and it's just something uh, um, to really enjoy. From the solar filter point of view, let me make this clear: it is okay to remove the solar filter during totality because you're not looking at the sun anymore. The sun's covered up by the moon, you're looking at the moon and the corona of the sun, which is perfectly fine to look at. Uh, but only during totality is it safe to do this. So we'll be talking more about this, but the whole rest of the time you have your solar filter on and you're just taking these partial phases. And so to what are the ramifications of that? Well, remember when the solar filter is on, we just get these little yellow suns, which you might be thinking to yourself, well, how? what do we do with those? I mean, what's the point of that? And uh, what we and I'll go I'll go through that, but just to be clear, just to prepare your mind mentally for what's ahead, is just accept the fact that during the partial phases, you're just going to be taking a lot of images of little yellow suns, and then during totality, you'll be taking some images of the uh, with the solar filter off, and uh, and so forth. So I see I'm I'm not really looking at the chat, but I see that there's some activity there. So I'm just going to check in with Suresh to see if there's anything. Yeah. That yeah, I held off on a few of these, Mike, because I think you might be covering some of this. But uh, if you are, just say you'll, you'll cover and we'll save it. But um, let's start with Nick Johnson's question about uh, your thoughts on using H alpha scopes for the eclipse. Oh, go for it. I'm not going to be talking about that today. I don't have one, but I think that's a great idea. Yeah, Nick, just FYI. So you won't be able to see anything during totality through an H alpha scope, but you can see the partial phases as the sun as the moon is eating into the sun 
and see the prominences and in, in the Absolutely. sunspots, but you won't be able to see anything during totality except for the prominences that are off off on the sides. Um, you won't be able to, see, able to see corona or anything. And then the next question, Steve Emmert asked, are there advantages and disadvantages to the flexible silver-coated colored mylar so film solar filters versus the rigid silver-coated color glass filters? Hmm. Uh, that's a great question. And what I will say to that question is we're going to have a whole session where we talk about this, but the I, there, I get lots and lots and lots of questions like, which is better, this or that? And um, my advice is to try it out and judge that for yourself because there's each person's camera, telescope, lens, filter, everything is so unique. I mean, there's some broad generalizations. I found both to be very good as I'll go cut to the chase. I mean, I think they're both almost indistinguishable. If you get the, uh, the Kendrick, uh, Botter filters, and then you look at the, some of the glass filters I'm going to be describing, and I've got an example to show you, but I really think that the best way to come to your own conclusions on this is to do some testing. I'll explain exactly how to do that and, uh, get some test shots under different circumstances and then really study those. We have plenty of time to do that before the eclipse. And that way you can go into the eclipse confident that you've made the right choice for the equipment that you have. and Because you're going to get different opinions from different people. And it's sometimes it's like, well, I heard this person say that. I heard this source say that. And they're both really good sources, but they're different. What should I do? And, you know, it's kind of like if you go to a dinner with a bunch of friends and everyone orders something different, they're all great dinners. They're just a little bit different because everyone has different preferences. Yeah. So I think, I think that's a lot of that actually has to do with the color too. It's like your color preference. Because yeah. basic Mylar filters will show the sun as bluish. And some of the other filters out there will show it as more orange. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that comes down to what your preference is as to how you want the sun to look. Uh, John Renwick asks, is it okay to look at the sun through welder's glasses? Uh, you know, I've heard, yeah, yes. If, well, number 13 is the uh, uh, 12, I think is okay. 13, if I was, I've actually have a, a welder's glasses that I can't remember that's a grade or a, uh, how it's rated, but um uh 13 is seems to be accepted by uh, uh bob um berman bob berman and uh, uh, bob berman yep yeah writes a column in astronomy and he had a whole he had a really good article about this i think in the summertime or in the spring and he recommends uh a welder's glasses at a, at a 13 what, <laughs> i don't know what it's called is a 13 grade or 13 level and i actually picked one up the difficulty i found with the welder's glasses is that they optically are not great and uh so you, you're you know you might want to shop around a little bit with that but yes i understand that 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 can be just fine so bruce mcdonald asked more a more technical question i'm going to save that one till the end mike because i suspect you're going to cover some of it okay. um but we'll hold on to that does anybody else have any questions uh, for right now for anything that's been covered Uh, Dune asks, what other things would be okay to look at the sun without welder's mask or sun filter glasses? None come to mind. I don't mean that facetiously. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, I, I can't really stress enough the danger of looking at the sun without adequate protection. And uh, the only thing that I feel safe that I'd let myself or my family or my kids look at the sun would be metalized, uh, you know, solar filters that are certified by that certification that I had on the slide that um, you can go back to review. But beyond that, I, yeah, I, I, you know, June clarified. Uh, I think besides the sun, so I think she's. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a he or she, but uh, I think they're they're asking about the planets, like your, like what other things are visible outside the sun during the eclipse. Oh, I'm so sorry, I misunderstood completely. Uh, yeah, we'll get a little bit to that, but uh, it really depends a lot. It's a great question because, uh, especially for the Astronomical Society, because it depends on how dark it gets. And I think this is, should be a pretty dark eclipse from what I'm reading. And uh, so we will uh, all look forward to that with great excitement. <laughs> I've got a couple of slides that will show you what may be visible, and I can show you how to look into that more in more depth using Solarium by switching the atmosphere on and off. But uh, yeah, that's a lot of fun to contemplate for sure. And the last question I see for now is both John and Bruce. It's not a question, it's a comment. They both suggest using a pinhole camera a box or a pinhole projection to see the the sun, you know, the phases. So absolutely correct. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Phenomenal. All right. I'll turn it back to you, Mike. Okay, very good. So yeah, as you just saw, I mean, I love 
uh, the opportunity to answer questions. And especially, I can guarantee if you have a question, someone else does too. So please don't be shy about um, uh, editing into and yeah, entering into the chat. So, okay, so that's good. So let's talk briefly about just that, the pinhole camera topic, because this is something that is uh, amenable, especially during the, well, it's almost entirely during the, the partial phases. And I uh, copied these screenshots from an article on space.com about using, as you can see here in the reference, uh, space.com about using your cell phone. And the author here demonstrates what not to do. And she says, don't do this. <laughs> and you might be able, I tried this during the annual eclipse, and you can try this on any sunny day, is to use the front facing camera on your cell phone with a pair of eclipse glasses or any sort of metalized film. And I, you know, I, I found that to work sort of, but uh, you, you can try that. But as you just heard, the suggestion of using a pinhole is a great way to view the eclipses, the partial phases of the eclipse when the uh, during daylight. And this is an indirect method, but it's a powerful one. Um, this, if you just, this is just a screenshot of uh, partial phase, I think pinhole, uh, at least all has pinhole, so I must have typed that in. And as you can see here, this is, oh, right. So this is, um, there's a lot of different ways of going this. So this is from the annular eclipse. This is a friend of mine, Matthew, and he's demonstrating this. He actually, uh, it's not exactly a pinhole, but it's more like in a, a pencil hole on this piece of cardboard. And you can see um, project, you can, as the sun comes through that, you can see the partial phase projected onto this uh, piece of card. And then he also demonstrated using the Skywatcher GTI instruction manual, the um, partial phases that come through just a, 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 a plant. This is a shrub. This is in the Chaco Culture, uh, Chaco Culture National Historical Monument. And this is a, a close-up of that. And you can see the, 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 the extreme crescent suns. This is about to become an annular eclipse. And this, like, this is, I think, during annularity or towards the end of annularity. This is a video that I shot of just the ground. You can see there, and there's a bush and various people um, enjoying the eclipse. And then this is, uh, I was just holding up a piece of paper in my hand here. Uh, this looks like annularity. And you can see the, uh, the essentially the pinholes of the shrub, of the leaves of the shrub um, projecting little sun images onto a piece of paper. It's a terrific way of sharing this with uh, you know bystanders and other people and It'd be great to have, if you had a white t-shirt, you could be wearing it and have someone project this onto you. And uh, I mean, that'd be a great photograph. Uh, you can get creative with some of the pinhole um, arrays that you can use. You can contemplate, these are colanders and and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of fun things you can do here. So that's that's basically, you know, as far as, as far as cell phones go, I don't see, you can also just try taking a shot of the surroundings with a cell phone during totality. Uh, but those are some ideas. But now let's get into kind of the heart of it, the, the wide angle shots and ways to really get into that. So the advice I would give for this is um, to just consider using, again, during the partial phases, you're going to want to use a solar filter. But then during totality, just use an aperture priority exposure mode with a negative 1.7 EV exposure compensation. That works pretty well. I've got an example of that. You might consider bracketing the shutter speeds within totality. We'll talk more about that too. That's a new phrase. But this is a pretty easy type of shot to get because you uh, can let the camera do most of the thinking about what the exposure is that you want to get. Um, and this is how I shot this in 2017, and I think it worked pretty well. Um, you can consider these, this multi-image uh, blend, as I show here. This is the one I showed earlier. I'll talk about how, how to get this. And in, specifically, the way to begin to think about this is this is a combination of a bunch of different images, I guess 20 or so. 20 or, 20 or so. And the images, the partial phases, are shot with the solar filter on. And whoops, uh, come back here, whoops. And the totality shot with the foreground is with the filters off. And then I put the filter back on for the remaining phases. So if you remember, this is what everything looks like with the solar filter off. This is what it looks like with the solar filter on. Um, making the connection back to this point. And so this is, in, practice, in actuality, what those shots look like. So if you look very carefully, I hope this comes across on the Zoom call. But if you look at, you know, for example, shot number one, right about where I have my mouse is a little sun. 
and then it's moved a little bit here to shot two to shot three and all these shots as they get as they move across the uh the field that's all these shots are each shot is just a little sun i have a shot of totality and then the partial phases and then i combine those later on as you can see here so these i took let's say these two shots of these two suns and i combine them into this i do that with the all the other phases i using star stacks if you're familiar with star stacks it's, it's, this is a program for making star trails. It works really great for uh, partial phases and eclipses. And you just blend the parcels together using star stacks. You can also use the light and blend mode in Photoshop. And uh, Sequitur has a method for doing this as well. If we have time, I might be able to demonstrate this uh, using either star stacks or Photoshop. And once you have that image, it looks something like this. Uh, again, this is just the partial phases. You take that along with this image and you uh, blend them together to get the final blended image. It's as simple as that. It takes a little bit of planning and foresight to get these different shots, but the actual process isn't that difficult. And as I'll talk a little bit later, there's plenty of chances to practice this ahead of time, except just without the totality shot. But for putting this type of shot together, I'll show you a couple of examples of how to do that. This is the exact same method I used to create this shot uh, and this shot as well. In the um, uh, in the in this instance, I don't know if you can see. I was just looking to see if you can see how well this is coming out. Um, the upper left hand corner and the upper left corner, you can see a shot that I took from the. So I said the same tripod position, without moving the camera. I uh, just stayed there the rest of the night. Uh, a bunch of stars, and then I have the maximum totality, and I blended those together in Photoshop, like as you can see on the right. When I blended out the hole for totality, I got rid of the eclipsed sun. So I wanted to create this, this hole in a space kind of appearing thing. Then I took that one in the upper left and um, combined that with the partial phases and then a nice shot of the totality and got the image at the bottom. So again, if you have the images from the day of the eclipse, you can actually put images like this together without a, a lot of, uh, the actual execution of this assembly isn't that difficult. Uh, let's talk briefly about telephoto projects. Um, again, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, just single shots during the diamond, you know, this is the diamond ring uh, part of uh, totality. You can also consider composite shots and blends of multiple images in the way that you can see here. So um, the this is a single shot. This is from that 340 millimeter uh, telephoto setup. This is a 200 millimeter lens with a 1.7x teleconverter. And then I just crop that down to get this shot. So you, that's the type of thing you can see there. And then assembling these in Photoshop, uh, as I'll, I'll say, I've got an example of how to dem demonstrate this a little bit later. You can uh, take any number of these different types of uh, individual images from a telephoto shot and combine them in Photoshop. Now, the, the, the point here is that when we look at these types of composites, the benefit that you have is that they um, don't have any foreground in them. So it's you're able to kind of isolate just the uh, the portion of the sky that you're interested in and uh, no other part of it. And so that actually makes this a lot easier. The sun doesn't have to be in the center of the image and it's actually pretty straightforward. This is a shot during totality and this is a completely different thing. So these are, sh these are individual shots taken several minutes apart in this instance, as the sun has moved a lot, or the, the moon has moved a lot relative to the sun. So these are images taken during the partial phases, which you may remember, I think in total add up to almost hours worth of partial phases. These shots are a rapid fire burst uh, taken almost instantly, one after within like a matter of one or two seconds, less than two seconds, where the um, shot at the upper left was taken at a very fast shutter speed and then the shutter speed was systematically increased by the camera through a process called exposure bracketing until the bottom right image, I think, was about a half a second. And what that process does is it reveals different portions of the eclipse. In the upper left, you can see the prominences that uh, Suresh was talking about, but you don't really see the corona because it's so dim, it's not captured in this very fast exposure. But at the bottom right, uh, you don't see the prominences because they're washed out by the glare of the corona. It's so bright, but you can see the outer parts of the corona. So each one of these shots reveals a different portion, really, of the total eclipse. And then you can artfully combine these in Photoshop to reveal uh, the image on the upper, on the on the lower right. So this is a great 
telephoto project to consider um, with this eclipse, because this is what a total solar eclipse is all about. So this is certainly, I'm sure, a priority for many of the people on the line today. All right, so those are the suite of types of image projects. Now, what I want to do now is talk a little bit about, um, oh, that's right, I guess I was <laughs> ignore this for a minute. This I got to tell you, this uh, this is a pretty uh, chunky uh, talk, and uh, <laughs> it's come together in different uh, formulations over the last few uh, few days in particular. So to be clear, the thing that I was just describing was all done using this camera right just here. And as you can see, this little white thing, it's, a, it's just protruding a, sh a short distance. This is a very portable uh, star tracker. It's the Polari star tracker. And I had to carry all this stuff up on my back. Um, it was a few thousand feet elevation gain. And it was nine miles, you know, two in the morning start time. And um, I was trying to keep my uh, the weight down. And it did a pretty decent job of keeping the the sun centered in the in the frame and uh you can see i have the uh my cable release i'll be talking about that in a minute and i have my instruction sheet right here i want to talk a little bit about this instruction sheet because this is something that you're in my advice in my opinion that i'm certainly going to put together again and you might want to consider doing the same thing it starts over here and it ends down here i had a nikon d800e as you can see here this is all notes like this is just literally notes i typed to myself it's kind of a mike shaw stream of consciousness if you will and so I just had a few notes about how to set things up, what to do the night before. Well, there was no night before because I had to hike in the morning of. And then what to do when I arrived at my shooting stop spot. And then 30 minutes before first contact, what to do. These are my settings right here. 20 minutes before second contact, three to four minutes. One minute before second contact, right after second contact. One minute after third contact, and so forth. And this was a great release because I had these, I had one of these on for each of these cameras. I, I, I thought it through, I printed them out, I put them in a Ziploc bag and I taped that bag to the tripod leg. And that's that's what I was studying during that uh, video that you saw at the very beginning, that um, having this was an enormous peace of mind in allowing me to uh, proceed with the day because I knew that I wasn't gonna forget something important like putting the solar filter back on or refocusing or, or anything like that. Um, all right, so let's now that we get, so now that you have some idea of like, you know, what could I do Let's uh, maybe I'll stop, stop here and check in with Suresh to see if we have any questions before we jump into the gear. Yeah, uh, Peter asked a question, Mike, that I, I could I could probably help as well with. He asked, when using a star tracker, do you have any advice for how to align it with a celestial pole in daylight before totality? Would a celestial pole be a, sufficient to adjust for solar motion? Um, great, great, great. Take that first? I Go do ahead. have a couple of slides to talk about that coming up. Okay, so we'll hold off session. on that. Well, we'll that. And then John Renwick just has a comment. During the 2017 eclipse, he was in the path of totality, but there were distant clouds outside of the umbra that reflected a lot of sunlight. Uh, so he didn't get to see it as, get as dark as he had hoped. Yeah. So I guess that's a possibility, right? You get clouds reflecting sunlight. And so I'm sorry, I, I, missed the, to I missed the first part of that. Was he in or outside totality? He was in totality, but there were clouds, uh, uh, I guess, on the horizons oh, that uh, reflected sunlight. So it didn't get quite as dark as he thought. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's a neat. That's and that's that kind of goes to taking a giant step back. I mean, we're getting down into the weeds of the of this now, and um, um, the uh, there's a lot that happens during an eclipse. I mean, as I say, this is a very photo, you know, photography centric presentation about you know some details about what to do. But look at where we are. I mean, here we are in Grand Teton National Park. I mean, it's. It's it's one of nat is one of nature's finest phenomena that the sun and the moon appear to be the same size. I mean, what are the odds of that? It's just what are the odds? It's amazing. It's just Mike, just one one quick thing for yeah. Peter's comment. Yes. Uh, I did a little math, and the sun actually will drift an eighth of a degree during the three hours uh, because of its its motion. Oh, that's good to um, know. Yeah. yeah, it's about a degree a day, and yeah. this is three hour eclipse duration, yeah. so it's about an eighth of a degree. Um, so you will have a little bit of drift. So depending on your on your focal length, if you're using a high focal length, you may have to account for that. But if you're using a wide angle, you probably will be okay. Fair, okay, that's a good one. I want to talk about uh, solar tracking. Okay, um, so to this point that just was raised about the uh, daytime polar alignment, um, if you look, come and you can see it here. So if you look at this camera on the right, the tele with the telephoto lens on it, and this little white uh, rectangular box. That, that box has to be 
lined up with uh, the Earth's celestial pole, with the North Star. And as I mentioned, I got here at nine in the morning and there, I couldn't see the North Star because it was daytime. So the challenge immediately then becomes, well, how do you align this star tracker with the North Celestial Pole during the day? So that was the nature of the question. I, as I mentioned, I've got a couple of ways to answer this and um, we'll, uh, and then Suresh, you know, can add in as well. But let's talk now about gear to, so we can get started on this. And again, I just want to say, especially if you're just joining us, you out, oh, now ignore that because that was, uh, I just want to say, you have to use the solar filter when you're dealing with the sun. So here we are. These are the three types of solar filters that I personally have right now. And I'm probably almost certainly not going to use the Thousand Oaks optical filter in April. And I almost certainly will use one or both of the Kendrick and the Case filters. Now, the, this goes, let's, let's take a minute here. And I have these, uh, I can, you know, I, I've got these right here on the desk in front of me. The Kendrick is very similar to the Thousand Oaks optical filter. It's, I think, a, a better ver better quality version of it. I haven't exhaustively tested it myself yet, so I'm sort of reserving judgment on that. The Case neutral density filter, which I said a minute ago, don't use a neutral density filter. What's going on with this? Well, this one worked pretty well for me in October and during some other testing. This is a uh, 100,000, I don't know, stop. ND filter, it's glass. And so this goes to the, so the filter and the, so let's put the thought. So anyway, jumbling up a few different things. So the Kendrick and the Thousand Oaks optical filters are flexible mylar plastic films that are very thin, but they've been metalized. The ND filter is a glass filter that attaches to your lens through this magnetic um, ring, quite convenient. And gives very sharp images. And I'll, I'll show us some examples of that in a bit. But it is a neutral density filter. So I have to caution you and say that it, it does not block the IR light or the ultraviolet light that the metalized filter does. So I want to, one of my to-do things over the next you know <laughs> days before the eclipse is to really do a side-by-side -side comparison along the lines of what I'm about to show you, comparing these two filters to make a final decision on what to use in April. But... Uh, <laughs> There they are. So if you wanted to, so Kendrick is a great outfit in uh, Toronto, Canada. Uh, they are very responsive. I think that they are able to handle um, orders up through the next month or so. And Case, uh, I've just got on your, everyone's favorite um, internet uh, supplier and I was able to get a, a version of that there. So in any event, there, those are the filters that I have. And um, what am I doing here? Oh yeah, so for the wide angle shots, uh, the one on the left, I could just screw, the, in 2017, I just used the Thousand Oaks filter and they worked okay. I mean, the images were a little bit soft in my opinion now, but in the image on the left, I just had a screw in filter and the, um, but this, the, the problem here in the, the one on the right is it's a wide angle <clears throat> lens and there's no way to screw a filter into that. So what I did and what you may want to do if you are going to use a wide angle lens, which I think you might want to do in this particular ellipse, and I'll explain why, is to adapt a telescope solar filter to oops, your, oops, uh, your wide angle lens. And the way I did this is, this was not my idea. I, was, I read this from someone else uh, somewhere on the internet or astronomy magazine or sky and telescope. And um you simply take a piece of a bunch of cardboard and you create your own adapter thing that works quite well. I mean, as you saw in the example that showed the light leakage around the edge, there is a little bit of light leakage uh -huh. that you kind of have to deal with. But um, the uh, uh, uh -huh. but, uh, oh, oh, I think Steve Emmert, we have a you may want to go back to mute. Um, oops, let's go back to here. So here we have the. Uh, but this is a way to uh, adapt a solar filter to a wide angle lens. And as I said, you're, as you'll see in the uh, planning part of the presentation, we're most likely gonna want to use a, a 14 or a 16 millimeter lens for the wide angle shots. All right, so with that, then with the telephoto lens, on the other hand, we have um, no problem. We just use a, uh, a, uh, a typical filter. All right. So, but uh, that's right. So the key here is to use this tracker, which is this thing right here. And I have it set up right next to me, just out of the frame. Maybe we can talk about this if we have like a live demo uh, portion of, of questions. I have all these goodies I can uh, show you. 
But the, there's a bunch of advantages um, to using a tracker during the eclipse. And one huge advantage compared to what you typically think of using a tracker for. One is that um, this is, these are just people using the trackers in the uh, in the uh, in the um, October eclipse. It has the opportunity for sharper images for longer exposures. It's hugely less maintenance for you because once you line up the sun in the frame, the sun shouldn't move out of the frame during the course of the eclipse. It's possible to do some fantastic time lapse uh, projects, and you also don't need perfect polar alignment uh, for this thing to work. And let me explain why. This was a, uh, it never really occurred to me before, but I had this aha moment in October. Let me share that with you now. Typically for deep sky astrophotography images, we're taking shots that are, you know, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes for one single exposure. And the alignment of your tracker system has to be perfect. If there's any movement during that 20 seconds at all, you can see it in the shot. We're not using a tracker for that here. All we're doing with our tracker, remember our exposures are a fraction of a second. Um, all we're doing, all we're doing, using the exposure of the tracker for is to keep the sun in the frame. It's a totally different thing. So it's a much more relaxed uh, set of requirements on the polar alignment because of that. If the sun drifts a little bit within the frame over the course of you know a minute, no problem. I mean, we're not shooting for a full minute. We're shooting for a, you know five hundredth of a second or thousands of a second. So it really takes a lot of the stress off the polar alignment. I mean, now let's talk about the question about how. To, oh no. Um, so this, I think. Uh, okay, so this is a video showing uh, again from Stellarium, a simulation showing. Uh, this is a real time video showing how fast. And this, okay, um, let me back up a minute. So this, I was just talking about trackers, but what if we don't want to use a tracker? Well, let's suppose we don't have a tracker. I don't want to use it for some reason or it breaks or we can't get it or the polar alignment becomes too much of an issue. You don't really need one um, to have a successful day at all. In this illustration, I have no tracking at all. I'm just, I, I this is right before totality, as you can see. This is in real time. As you can see, the time, and the clo uh, clicking off in the lower right hand corner. And what you can see here is this is just a few moments before totality. And you can see the sun moving across the frame. This is that red, this red frame, by the way, that you see here is the frame corresponding to a 500 millimeter field, uh, a lens, a 500 millimeter focal length lens, which is a, a pretty long lens for a camera. And what you can see here is that the sun doesn't move as much as you, it's not like moving as fast as you might think it is. And, um, you know, like I say, if we were shooting a 10 second or 20 second exposure, I'm going to speed things up. If we were shooting a 10 second or 20 second exposure, then this, this motion would be completely unacceptable. We have star trails, all sorts of bad things, but we're not, we're shooting fractions of a second. And so what happens is even when we get into totality that we'd be taking our solar filter off about now, by the way, um, Diamond ring, diamond ring, Bailey's beads, filaments. Oh, promises rather. Uh, totality, 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 totality. Oh, get ready to put your solar filter back on. Get ready to put your solar filter back on. Oh, no, we're still bracketing. We're going to be talking about that. Oh, it's lasting longer than I thought. That's great. Look at that beautiful thing. And then all of a sudden it gets all the way over here. And uh, we start to see uh, diamond ring again. And even here, you can see I haven't moved the camera uh, during all of that. The sun stayed in the field of view of my 500 millimeter lens. So if the tracker you have doesn't work or you don't have a tracker, it's still fine. I can say it's mostly a matter of convenience in, um, in all of this. So I wanted to get that out of the way. Now to the question of daytime polar aligning your tracker. All you need to do, oh, the first option is if you go to a spot where you're spending, you're going to be shooting the eclipse from where you are, that's great because the night before you can polar align your tracker and then you just don't move anything. <laughs> you just leave it there set up and shoot the eclipse the next day without moving anything. The second option is you can polar align your tracker the night before. But and you're saying this is option two is if I'm waking up in um, Austin and I need to drive 50 miles. Well, what you can do the night before is you can still polar align the tracker and you keep the altitude you know, the elevation, the same. You don't really move that. And then when you arrive at your shooting location, you just set up your tracker so that it's level 
and aligned uh, facing north. And you do that with a compass during the daytime. And that's good enough for these, um, for, for an eclipse in my, uh, my experience, in my experience and opinion, because of the latitude in uh, uh, the precision. We don't have to have a, a lockdown precision. And then the worst case is you don't have that even that option. You just literally land at the airport on the day uh, of, you know, of the eclipse or, you, or before the eclipse, or it's cloudy the night before. All you have to do, actually, the tracker will have an altitude dial built in, a scale, as you can see here. And all you need to do really is to set that to your latitude, which is good enough, and then align the tracker facing north uh, during the daytime. And that is still just fine. And that's really what I did with the Polari during the 2017 eclipse. I just aimed, I, there's a little latitude uh, adjustment needle that you can align um, with, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the tracker's um, elevation uh, altitude, and you aim it north and, and just turn it on and let it track. Uh, a compass is a good thing to have, so bring that. Oh, we're talking about gear. Okay, so gear. We're talking about gear. So tracker. So this is, uh, get a tracker if you're going to, but all that said, uh, it's helpful to have a tracker. If you have one, by all means, bring it, uh, practice with it, and um, bring a compass. That's always a great thing for that reason. Your cell phone may act up or they um, may not work or the battery may drain. But your compasses are great. You want to get a focusing loop. And again, I have one here I'll, I'll show, but these are great because they really allow you to magnify the screen of your display and really zoom in on things at close range. And here's my sort of uh, <laughs> um, detailed focusing technique. Install the solar filter, get the sun on the LCD screen, magnify it on the screen as much as possible. Adjust the exposure of the sun until it's slightly underexposed, and then find the edge of the sun or a group of sunspots. Keep this to a minimum, but then focus on those sunspots in particular. Once you've got it in focus, you can demagnify everything and, and proceed. But importantly, check the focus throughout the, the process. There's a number of um, cases that I've heard about where people lose focus halfway through the eclipse. They've been sadly disappointed. Special note, this is especially... Um, uh, pertinent now that we have uh, mirrorless cameras is to make sure that your camera does or does not lose focus. You need to know if it does or it does not lose focus when you switch it off. Some mirrorless cameras will do this. And you, then when you switch it back on, you have to refocus everything. Um, and to check this, just focus on something manually, turn the power off, turn it back on and see if it's still in focus. And you may be able to change this in a setting. I know this has come up in a couple of my workshops and people have been able to uh, figure out how to disable this. Um, during uh, uh, a setting. Hey, Mike, um, can I kind of just for a second, quick second? Please do, yeah. If you, if, you, if you go back two slides, one more. Yeah, uh, one more. There's a, uh, yeah, I guess one more. <laughs> There's a fourth <laughs> method to uh, daytime polar alignment. That's the drift method. I put a comment in the chat that you guys can see in the comment section uh, with a link to an article on it. But okay. the idea there is once you get past uh, using a compass to get close, you can use the drift method to basically let the sun drift for a few minutes and, it. and it'll tell you which way you're off. And if you read the article in that link, it, it tells you. So for example, if the star is drifting south, the sun's drifting south, mm -hmm. the polar axis that you're pointed at is too far east. If the sun drifts north, it's too far west. Nice. So that's a, that's another way you could really get nailed down that that tracking, especially for wider angle shots that you don't have to be that's precise. Great. That, that's great. Let sure. me make Thanks one other that. comment. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Let me make one other comment. Myron and Steve Emmert, can you guys please put your uh, your systems on mute? I think you're the only ones that are not on mute. Steve just did. Thanks, Steve. Back to you, Mike. Oh, Thanks, great. Thanks, Myron. Yeah, that's risk. Thanks for that because I mean, and you know, a lot of this stuff, as I say, it seems kind of down in the weeds and like, oh man, this is like some pretty detailed stuff. But, you know, this is a, this, this is it. I mean, this is the, um, this is your solar eclipse, <laughs> the great American solar eclipse. So I, th and I think it's kind of worth it now. Um, and thanks Suresh. Uh, so, okay. Something else that you're definitely going to find helpful is if you have some, something that you can use to cover yourself and your uh, LCD screen with during the eclipse. And this is sort of a good time to mention the value of practicing ahead of time. I practiced from my upstairs window in at home. I practice in the hotel window, as you'll see. The more times you actually do this, 
Uh, I practice that in the backyard a bunch of times. Every time you set up your equipment, aim it at the sun with a solar filter on, focus on it and start shooting. I mean, it's the difference between re watching a video of someone swimming and actually swim jumping in a swimming pool. They're totally different experiences. And uh, I'll talk more about the importance of practicing, but you know, having something like this that you can throw over your head to block out all the light and allow you to see you know, the, 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 the screen really helps. I mean, the thing that's so different, I mean, we're, we're astronomer, astrophotographer type people, and we're used to doing everything at night. And there's not a lot of ambient light at night. This is completely different. This is the height of day. And the sun is very high in the sky. And uh, it's it's a little bit awkward. I mean, it's, there's the solar eclipse squat, I kind of like to call it, where you're kind of like angling up at this weird at this weird angle. But in any event, so think about that. And then finally, you can consider, cons you consider I don't know if, I'm, if my final recommendation is to do this or not, but you can consider putting tape on to maintain maintaining focus. The reason I'm only hesitating on this is that um, during the course of the eclipse, everything's going to heat up and your focus may change because of that. So then if you have to refocus, this would make it impossible to do that. You're definitely going to want to bring, especially for the telephoto shots, a, uh, an, a, a cable release because um, it reduces vibration. Uh, I would not, I would recommend not having a wireless, a so-called wireless or infrared cable release but rather having one that attaches directly, plugs into your camera. And um, you might do want to bring a spare. I've had these, I've seen these things fail many times on workshops, but this allows you to do a lot of things that um, make it easier to do than actually having to push the shutter button manually. So think about uh, bringing one of these. And even better, uh, become if you're not already familiar with, uh, the, the thing on the right is a time-lapse, by the way. Uh, if you're not already familiar with your in-camera interval timer capability, this is a really good time to learn about that. Um, it allows you to do these sequences uh, without you having to do anything. It takes all the pressure off. And I use these almost without even thinking about it on most of the projects that I do these days. So certainly can I consider one of these. And uh, as I say, you can on the right is a, a short time lapse put together from an automated sequence of these. By the way, when I'm showing these uh, sequences in the middle, where you see these suns at these very different inc increments, you might think that I only photograph the sun, and th these increments are probably like five minutes apart, yeah, these, these particular shots. I'm actually shooting the sun every five seconds or every 15 seconds. Um, and then once I've, so I have like a constant stream of suns, and then once I know where totality is, I then back count from there and forward count, and then pick, you know, uh, images every five minutes from there. But um, so if you made a time lapse from just these images, it would be a very, very short time lapse. Well, I actually have lots and lots and lots of images that are not shown in this composite image, but I can use to make a time lapse and that you can use to make a time lapse as well. You might want to consider getting one of these things. They're called a stone bag or a, I don't know what a stone bag. And you basically, they Velcro to like 15 or $20 on Amazon and you can um, Velcro them to your tripod legs. And you can, they're very handy for holding gear. You can put some rocks in there, some sand, and they really stabilize things. Uh, but I'm definitely going to be having one of these on each of my tripods. And then this app, Solar Eclipse Timer, works really well. I haven't really played with it recently, but I used this during the 2017 eclipse. And I guarantee that wherever you are, there will be people with this. And it's, uh, it's a very stark warning. It's like, Solar filters now. Put on solar filters. There's this, this pre-recorded thing, but it, it works well for your location. And anyway, I'm just going to put this up. I'm not going to describe it in detail. You can explore it on your own, but I'm probably going to use it, and it, it works pretty well. And then for weather, these are my main weather sources. I mean, there's more out there, but these are the ones that I use. Um, I really like Astrospheric, the clear dark skies, weather underground, clear outside. Air now is good for smoke, uh, whoops, and windy. I know there's at least one person on here who is an expert windy user and uh, looking forward to uh, hearing more about that later. But in any event, um, these are the weather apps that I use in case that's a, in case you haven't come across any of those yet. Now, here's a QR code to a, a website, to my, a page on my website. And there's a caveat. 
that um, you can go to my, you can go to this page on my website, but Amazon just decided to disable the ability. I did have all these little icons for the things that I list. And this is like the intervalometers and the lens filters and all that. And there's just a little question marks now, but just go ahead and click on the question mark and it will take you to the, the object that you can uh, look at on Amazon, but just be aware of that, that it's, I just need to update that and I haven't done that yet. But um, the gear's there if you want to uh, explore that. All right, now let's hey, Mike, get, can I get in just for a sec. Oh yeah, please, my names. So we're at the one hour mark, so we're halfway through. I oh, figured yeah. it's a good time to, for me to catch up on comments and questions. Yes, um, let's see. Um, just as a whole bunch of comments, I don't see many questions. But I'll just go right through them real quick. Oh, for Michael sure. Michael Culper uh, says, "I have been experimenting with video. He took three thousand photos of Crater Lake." National Park with a fisheye lens and no filter. He was then able to combine that into a three minute time lapse. Uh, so that's an idea for somebody yeah. to during the eclipse is to is to create a whole bunch of pictures. And then you can later on turn that into a time lapse, a video time lapse. That's a great idea, Michael. Uh, John Renwick says that he thinks you can use a compass for polar alignment if you correct for local magnetic variation. Excellent point. Yep. Your, one of your earlier points. Uh, Michael Cowper again says he has many Kendrick filters and he loves them. Uh, the For finders, they work perfectly. Um, Kendrick has great customer service. Let's see. Bruce McDonald says he found that he gets okay alignment with a compass at inclinometer with local latitude. When using 400 and 500 millimeter lenses, there is some drift, but you shouldn't lose the sun. Okay. Uh, Greg Ferguson mentions uh, Nisi makes a filter bracket for Sony 14 millimeter lenses and a flat 100 millimeter by 100 millimeter solar filter. So for Sony users out there, FYI, uh, let's see, Michael again mentions he took 3000 shots of the eclipse with a broken on 12 inch fisheye, which is an interesting idea because that's a really big field of view. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, I should also mention, because Peter asked the question, this is being recorded, this presentation is being recorded, and this will be posted to our MAS YouTube channel uh, within a couple of days after this presentation. And then Dune mentions, uh, it's not impossible to get white versions to reduce heat. I'm not exactly sure what she means by that, but uh, get white versions to reduce heat. Dune, if you want to speak up, you can now if you like. Michael Cowper also mentions another thing. He uses a cable release for his timer to make most of his time lapse videos because it's cheaper and easy to use. So that's a good idea too to use a uh, cable release potentially. Uh, let's see. Dune says when when I get I I can get permanent eye damage because I was three hundred twenty three thousandth of a second late to put my solar filter back on. So that, that's an important point to make sure you put your solar filter back on at the right time after totality ends. Otherwise you can get uh you can damage your camera and or your eye. Uh Clayton mentions it's a, a good rough daytime alignment is possible with the uh APP PS Align Pro. I don't know if oh, that is yeah. an app. That's a great point. Um it uses your smartphone's inclinometer Compass and GPS. It works best if you have a saddle to place the phone on. So that's a good idea. Yeah, I'm going to talk uh, about that. Let's see. Uh, Clayton also mentioned solar finders are very helpful. Think if you bump your equipment, you need to find realignment. So yeah, a solar finder is a very low power. Uh, actually, it's like one X finder scope that works on the sun. So it's really important to have something like that available um, and hooked up to your scope. Because if you do lose the sun, if you bump your scope, if there's wind or something, it'll help you get the sun, get back on the sun quick, more quickly. And then Dune responded back. I was talking about equipment. Since black absorbs more heat than white, it would make sense to use white things instead of, I guess, instead of black. Yeah. Um, not sure exactly what things, but uh, so that's all the comments. Does anybody have any other questions right now? And Myron, yes, you are on mute. Thank you. Uh, Vaults mentions Canon users. The man magic lantern add-in worked great for advanced bracketing, and eliminated the need for an intervalometer. Though an intervalometer is still handy. Excellent. Agree. Okay, I think that's everything. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? All right, Mike, back to you. 
Okay, oh, that's great. I love. I'm loving this. I'm, I have a couple pages of notes already on my end. So the question about the Sunfinder also on the Kendrick solar filter. Um, if you see this uh, on the upper left, you can see a little pinhole with a little target over here. And this is very helpful for doing just that to so locating the sun. You can it projects an image of the sun um, on here. So this is this is a useful feature of the Kendrick filter. So I thought at this point I actually might um, stop sharing. So here I am. And a couple of things I want to do at this point, one of which is to uh, share a few of this, these these gizmos that we've been talking about. So the first thing that, that June reminded me of is this is an apparatus that I actually made for the annual eclipse in New Mexico. And it's a, this is the, it's, it's, it was again, not my idea, it was from a friend of mine. But the idea is I took a, a black, piece of black velvet cloth that I have for when I do studio stuff. And I use duct tape and I taped it to a space blanket. And the idea is that I can then, you know, get underneath it like this. And I have a, a nice little, um, a nice little shelter that uh, reflects, the, the, so this stuff reflects the sunlight um, and keeps that away. Uh, this is the loop I was talking about. So it looks something like that. And I've got a camera over here that, uh, uh, um, let's see what else. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. So, so, okay. So, so Mike, while you're looking for that, 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 uh, filter shelter you put over your head that's actually a really important point because during the 1991 eclipse my father got a massive sunburn on his head because he didn't have any protection didn't oh, wear yeah. a hat and yeah. so a few days later he did get a big sunburn remember if you're going to go someplace like texas or someplace like that where the sun's going to be high up in the sky it's going to be it's going to be a powerful thing on you so be sure to have some kind of protection a hat uh some kind of a umbrella or shield like mike just showed something just plan on having something um, let me add, since I stopped, let me add, Kirby, yeah, Kirby asked a question here that I think is important too. For a small refractor telescope, any recommendations for a solar finder? Oh. And Mike, I have a suggestion. There's a oh, there's please. a few that I, I just know. looked up. Uh, there's something called a Soul Searcher. Soul is spelled S O S O L, like Sol. It's the Teleview Soul Searcher is what I have. But when I googled it, there's a whole bunch of other ones as well. Apertura makes something called a Solar Finder. So sort of bony, which is spelled S V bony, it has something called a solar finder scope, and then spectrum telescopes has something called a heliopod sun finder for small scopes, two inch to six inch telescopes. So just uh, look uh, Google solar finder uh, Kirby, and a whole bunch of these will come up, and you can pick the one you want. Um, an, uh, another suggestion is you could put a solar filter on your finder scope. I know Orion sells one for 50 millimeter finder scopes. And that's what I use. Um, they're basically Mylar filters that go right over your finder scope. They're really easy. The thing I would suggest though, if you're going to go this route, buy your gear really soon because they're already starting to sell out on stuff ahead of the eclipse. So uh, be sure you do that. Anyway, back to you, Mike. Oh, this is all good, uh, Suresh. So um, as I say, I'm uh, the best thing I like about teaching is I learn so much. So, uh, this is just a quick demo of, this is my, um, I'll just take it off. This is the 14 to 24 um, lens. And this is that apparatus. This is a, a telescope lens. So that's what that looks like. Whoops. And put this out of the way. Um, this is the Kendrick filter, just so you know. The way this works is uh, this comes, there's the classic version that slips over your tele or your camera lens, but they, uh, they've discontinued that in favor of this thing that has these three nylon set screws. And like I said, I haven't exhaustively tested these, but I've heard everyone that's spoken, including someone just a minute ago that Suresh mentioned, loves these. And so I'm looking forward to testing that out. I suspect that might be uh, uh, what I use. And then this is that case ND100,000. And this I picked up from a tip. It's just, it's um, it's a classic ND. This is a classic ND filter. I'm trying to get a reflection on it. So it's, but it's glass. And I this was on a tip that uh, Alan Dyer posted. I'm going to have a description to his book here in a minute. Um, but it's just very dark. And I used this in the October eclipse successfully. 
And one nice thing about it is this is a the this ring screws into your telephoto lens, and this attaches to it magnetically. So when it comes time to take this on or off, you just take this off, and this stays attached to your lens. So you don't have to unscrew anything. You just like, and it comes off pretty easily. So that lessens the chance of disrupting your focus. And I think that's really about it. I mostly wanted to show you, I've got the Star Tracker set up over there. I mostly wanted to show you the Mylar film thing that Jun mentioned, because I think that was something that was a little off the radar and I found real helpful. So anyway, um, all right, so I'm going to go back to, so unless that has elicited any new comments, I'm going to go back to the presentation. Nope, I don't see anything new. It's all yours. Okay, all right. So we will carry on then. There's that, there's this, that, 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 that. Great, I, oh, um, yeah, the thing that uh, Clayton mentioned about the PS Align Pro, it's, this is something that is uh, relatively new, but very powerful. And I, th I think it's uh, PS Align Pro has a, a feature that you can, I think if you would Google, or maybe Clayton could Google or type it into the chat, but you can essentially, your cell phone shows, you, you sort of attach, you just place your cell phone like on the star tracker, as, as you mentioned, on a bracket on the star tracker, and then it shows you where you need to move to to get um, into alignment, and uh, it, it's it's great. I've seen it. A few people on workshops have used that, and it works really well. All right, all right. So uh, get that, get that, get that, get that. Settings. Okay. So get your notepads out. All right. Again, screenshot this or or, or so forth. Pretty basic stuff so far. Manual focus. It's just the way I like to do pretty much everything. Uh, I would recommend either, whoops, manual or, oops, manual or aperture priority. I'm going to talk more about this in a minute. Definitely turn your auto ISO off. I definitely turn your water, a white balance. Just take your white balance off auto white balance. Daylight's fine. Shade is fine. Tungsten is fine. Just anything except auto white balance. And when it comes to color, I mean, what my experience has been, I do all my color adjustments in Lightroom. So even if the, the sun comes out blue or white or yellow, I, I alter it slightly in Lightroom to uh, be what I like. Um, I would recommend turning off long exposure noise reduction. It's unlikely you're going to have exposures of a second or longer, but just in case you do, it's nice to turn that off so you don't get confused. And of course, you're going to be shooting in a raw file format. Now, here we go. Um, there's two main, as you've now seen and appreciate, there's two main stages, the partial phase with the solar filter on and the total eclipse with the solar filter off. And the big photographic question is what exposure should I use? Well, let's start with the first one and then we'll come to the second one. So for the first one, when you're shooting the partial phases, I'm recommending a manual exposure mode. So this is not aperture priority or, or program or, or shutter priority or anything like that. This is M. Manual exposure. It's not manual focus. That's MF, not AF. This is manual exposure, which is M. So then the question is, what shedding should I use? And this is where things kind of get interesting. So the recommended range of settings for an eclipse are these. You can read them, ISO, aperture, shutter speed. But Mike, that's a pretty big range. What are you guys, what are you, we're talking about the partial phases. So it's just the sun has a given exposure. What, what are we talking about here? It will be getting uh, slightly dimmer. And we need to settle on a combination of these before Eclipse Day. We don't want to be experimenting with this on Eclipse Day. We want to do all our experimentation right now in February, in the rest of January, February, and March. So when it's Eclipse Day, we know what we're going to use. Here's the procedure I recommend. Um, in order, the goal is to get our partial phase uh, settings. And here's where we start our practice sessions. And again, you can literally do this from inside. You don't have to go outside even. But uh, I recommend going outside just for optical clarity. Set everything up. Put your solar filter on your um, lenses. Vary the ISO aperture and shutter speed. I'm going to give you an example of this. And then this is the important part. Download and on a very <laughs> calm, rational frame of mind, study the images and decide which ones that you like the best. And then once you've settled on that, try it again another day or later that same day and confirm them. And then once you've got that, you're done. You don't need to worry about this question anymore. So for an example, 
I, the example I'm about to show you, I set up my camera with a 500 millimeter lens. I didn't use my tracker, didn't need to. I just set up the camera with the lens. I stuck that case ND filter I just showed you. And I varied the ISO between 200 and 400. I tried those three apertures and I tried these uh, five shutter speeds. So this is what that looks like. So the first thing I did was I set the ISO to 400. I set the aperture to this, which is a minimum, it's wide open basically. And then I varied the shutter speeds between these. And then I did the same thing here, except I changed the aperture to F8 and did the same thing once again, changed the aperture at F11, and I did one more at F200. Now, okay, Mike, that's a lot of stuff going on. How do you deal with that? Well, what's interesting is that, as just one example, the three shots that I've outlined in red all have the same equivalent exposure. They just have different combinations of ISO and aperture. They're all shot at, uh, or sorry, shutter speed and aperture. So which one is the best? Well, when I downloaded those, I, I mean, I did this over a whole range of different things. And I went through them and studied them. I figure, I mean, this is a once in a lifetime thing. I only have to ever do this once, really. Um, or maybe twice the next time I go on an eclipse. But, and it's, honestly, I mean, this is kind of, to me, part of the fun. It's part of the journey. I mean, if I hated doing this, I just wouldn't do it. And you don't, you don't have to do this. I mean, it's, I, I like doing this type of stuff and maybe you do too. But in any event, um, I kind of settled in on these three combinations and the two on the right were one exposure stop dimmer than the one on the left. So I just increased those by one stop in Lightroom. That's what these mean. But the, I, the, this, the exposure settings are as you see here on the bottom. And so this is the way they look in Lightroom with a 500 millimeter lens. That's how big the sun is in a 500 millimeter frame. And then I enlarge them. I said, oh, and these, you can see the sunspot groups that I was focusing on. And I like that one right there. So I enlarged that again. And what I immediately found was that I liked that one the best. Uh, if I compared that one against either of the other two, I just found that to be by far crisper and sharper. And this is the sort of thing that I'm talking about. This, this is the heart of what I wanted to talk to you about today. This is the, to me, one of the most important messages I wanted to convey is to do this type of experimentation yourself. And then when you go through these images and look at them carefully yourself and, you know, and study these, you will say, I have no doubt in my mind that this is the best combination of the settings I want to use for the eclipse. And if someone says, oh, well, I think you need to use this. I say, that's fine, but I did that. And I, I like this one better. So that's one of the messages I wanted to convey today is um, to do that so that now look at where we are. When we are looking at the partial phases, I'm gonna say, oh, I'm gonna use an ISO of 400, an aperture of F8 at 1 hundredth of a second, done. I'm done, that's, that's what I'm gonna do. And I don't have to worry about that. That takes an enormous amount of stress out. And then sure enough, when I start shooting the sun, and you can you know practice this with these settings, practice shooting the sun on, you know, several more days between now and the, uh, the um, eclipse. And by the way, these settings may not work for you. They just work for me with that lens and that particular filter. But I had no, when I shoot the sun with these settings, it comes out perfectly every time. Suresh, did I like hear the you? One thing, yeah, yeah, one thing I want to add to this, though, is for people that are traveling through this eclipse, especially south, let's say Texas, the sun's going to be a lot higher in the sky. It'll also be a little after noon, right? So factor that into your, when you do your experimentation is that you'll have a little bit less atmosphere. The sun will be higher and, and more intense. So it'll probably be a slightly faster exposure than what you're going to test here in the wintertime uh, here in Minnesota. <laughs> That's a very, very good point because um, the it, little things like that can uh, make a surprising difference. So when you're, it, when you are traveling, assuming you are traveling, then you want to just be sure to build in some time. I was looking to see if I had a, a photograph of the angle of the sun. Um, you want to build in some time to uh, account for that. And as we get closer to uh, to April, I mean, the but even the latitude is going to be uh, significant. So this rest has a very good point that you are going to want to confirm this when you get down there. Um, Mike, so, let me throw out a couple of uh, questions yeah. and comments real quick oh, while, while I have you. So Clayton puts a couple of different uh comments in the chat here for people for do-it-yourself solar finders. So he's got uh, a link to something from Sky at Night magazine on how to build a simple solar finder. Oh, excellent. Uh, 
Ed Parkin asks a question, Mike. Mike, do you have any experience shooting images with one of the new smart telescopes, such as the Vionis, the Unistellar, ZWOC star, uh, with the solar filter, of course? Uh, they are extremely portable, and he's been considering getting one. Have you, do you have any experience with that? Because I don't. I don't, know I don't know. And, and you know, honestly, um, you know, sometimes I really feel like an old curmudgeon at a time like this. An eclipse is such a one-off event that uh, I'm, I would be hesitant to try something new on that day. I just, I, I want to do something that I've, draw, I've I've rehearsed exhaustively so that I know it's going to work. And if and so that said, if you have one and it works well for you and you try it ahead of time, then by all means, give it a go. But I, I haven't. Like on, a, on, a, on a similar vein, um, yeah. have you, uh, do you recommend using, maybe you're going to talk about this. So if you are, just stop me, but automated software. Uh, there's a couple of us that were talking about using some of the automation software out there for shooting totality. I'm a little scared of doing that myself, but some people are are looking into it. Do you have any advice? Or are you going to cover that? No, I, I, I'm just going to say no comment. I mean, it's it, it, if it, <laughs> I'm sure it's there for a reason. It, it can work really well and to get some of the really high end results. I don't know if there's another way to do it. Um, that I guess, but I don't have any. I don't really have anything pro or con. I'll just I'll, I'll just remain neutral on that. So it's uh, yeah. I, I'm a little bit scared of stuff like that myself. So I tend to do everything, uh, but that also limits what I can do because I'm you know doing things manually so and then i can't i don't know if this is the name ahad just asks uh any tips for how to consider weather if planning a trip would it be better to research places along the path that seem to have more sunny days per year or is it all pretty random as far as if it'll be cloudy or not on the day mike this Ooh, is a I big have, question yeah no let's, let's <laughs> talk about that that's a, that is a big question it's a good question that's a really good question and so um I don't have any graphics in this presentation, but there is a, a plot that I unearthed for when I was doing my research on this. And essentially, the closer you get to the Mexican border, the greater is the likelihood of clear skies, roughly yes. speaking. Yes, uh, there's I would a, agree. There's, yeah, there's a graph somewhere that shows the likelihood of clouds as you go along the eclipse path. And it basically just goes up as you go further to the northeast. Uh, yeah, but having grown up in Chicago, I was okay. say, having grown up in Chicago, uh, you don't really want to be in Illinois or Indiana or so during, uh, during the eclipse in terms of weather predictions. Uh, there's a greater than 50-50 chance it'll be cloudy, if not raining. Uh, so as Mike said, the further south you go, the better. It seems to be the if the published information. Actually, if you go into Mexico, it gets even better. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's some you know good and bad about that as well. All right, Mike, yeah, I'll leave it back a, up to you. If you have time towards the end, I'll see if I can dig that out. Um, but yeah, I think that, uh, but if you Google, you know, like one of the main eclipse sites um, will have that graph and it's a, it's an orange graph. And it, as I say, it goes from the lower left to the upper right. The other thing I wanted I'll, I'll to say- I'll take a look for it while you, while you do this. Okay, I'll, I'll okay. see if I can find it. Yeah. The other thing I want to say is that, and this is an interesting comment that I recently heard is that when you're, you, that, so that's like the, the most global way of looking at weather. It's just like the statistical year to year average. And then as you start getting closer to the day, you can start looking at like 10 day forecasts. Once you get within a day or so, you wanna just skip all of that and just look at satellite images of clouds. Like what are the clouds actually doing? Cause there's a lot of those satellite imagery, you know, animation loops. And I thought that was really good advice because certainly clouds can kind of form and then disappear when you least expect it. But if you see a big system moving in and you're just under to the south of it, or if you travel 100 miles, you can get to the south of it. That can be a very helpful uh, guide. But I know during the annual eclipse, we were, I mean, in the days leading up to it, went from perfectly clear skies to 100% overcast to perfectly clear skies within the matter of a week. And we were just had a heart attack every time we checked the weather. But um, but that's a great question. And I'm sure that uh, the uh, Minnesota Astronomical Society will have an active fertile discussion on weather in the days leading up to the eclipse. All right, so, uh, okay, so good. Suresh, anything else? No, Hello? it's all yours, Mike. I'm doing oh. some research for you. On oh, the... sorry. <laughs> I thought for a minute I dropped out. Like, oh, no, go ahead, Mike, all yours. <laughs> um, all right, yeah, so uh, we're going to carry on then. So, so to recap, uh, when we're doing the partial phases, um, 
just do the just do the practice sessions and you'll be able to figure that out. Once you have the um during the total eclipse, it's actually, as I say, pretty straightforward. Um have I uh, I'm trying to think, do I talk about this here or not? I think I talk a little bit more about the total eclipse uh exposure mode, but that, that's I wanted to show you the, that that point ahead of time. Planning. All right. Um so uh, not to punt. So when I there's a part of the talk when I uh, as I get into the eclipse day, which is in section after this. When I get into eclipse day, I'll have a session on what to do during each phase of the uh, eclipse. All right. So planning. Well, you know everyone's different here, and so you're all going to have your own approach to how you prepare the details of the actual eclipse or your plan for the day. This is an Excel spread or actually a Google Docs document I created for myself in 2017. I'll probably do something real similar for the upcoming eclipse. It's just something that I've thought through ahead of times. So I don't do, don't do something really um, ill-advised at the very last minute that I think at the time might be a good idea. Turns out not to be. So uh, however you do that, um, but when you, you know, ha having talked about all the stuff that we've talked about right now, um, when I approach uh, something like this, a project, the first thing I think about is what is it I want to shoot? Do I want to have a single shot or do I want to have one of those wide angle shots? When I have my plan, you know, I don't want to forget anything. So I write down everything I need. It sounds obvious, but you'd be amazed. I've had people show up at workshops without batteries, without memory cards, without tripods, without tripod brackets, the bait camera brackets. Once you have the gear needed, then where are you going to put your tripod? When are you going to start and stop shooting? And there's more to this than meets the eye. When exactly are you going to remove and reattach the solar filters? And then the overall logistics, like when do you need to arrive at the spot to give yourself plenty of time to set up and make any last minute adjustments? Because there will always be last minute adjustments. And then for a wide angle sequence, there's some subtler points I'm going to come back to. So Stellarium is a magnificent tool for doing any type of astronomical planning, research, getting to know the night sky. And I'm sure many of you already, if not everyone here, already uses it. If you haven't, there it is. This is a, uh, a, a screenshot I captured from Stellarium for Dallas, Texas at 1142. This is during totality. And in contrast to the zoomed in shots I was showing you a while ago, that have uh, that from 500 millimeters, this shows uh, 14 millimeters. This is a very wide angle shot and it shows roughly the position, well, not roughly, exactly the position of Jupiter, the eclipsed sun, uh, Venus, and then Saturn and Mars along with the foreground. So this gives you the type of, um, uh, you can do this type of planning with Stellarium. And if you look up here in this upper right-hand corner, this little circle with a rectangle in it that's um, highlighted is the custom ocular view. And what I've typed in here is, in this line here, which says telescope number 15, photo lens, 14 millimeters F28. I have actually entered this as a way to go into Stellarium and actually enter in for your camera and your lens, the details so that you can find out ahead of time. It, it will draw this, this diagram for you to indicate what you, uh, what you can expect to see. So Stellarium is very good for a generic sort of planning like this. But for those of you who know me um, reasonably well, know that I like to use um, apps for very detailed planning. And in particular, if you've never heard of the Planet Pro app, I urge you to consider getting it. I think it's $9.99 for $10 for, oh, it's a one-time download. I use this app like every day, multiple times a day. And I don't have time now to go into the details of it. Um, uh, if you're interested, I'm offering a workshop in Minneapolis in a couple of weeks that still has space, but like I'll design your nightscapes. But in any event, um, it's a very powerful app for planning detailed uh, um, plans, creating detailed plans for your imaging projects. And I'm going to give you a few examples of this. So uh, these are just a couple of screenshots. There's an eclipse tool. It has a bunch, it has like probably 15 or so tools built into it. This is the eclipse tool. It shows you the path of totality across the North America and Mexico. You can see um, uh, the path. I, I'm going to put the, I'm going to say, hey, planet, I'm going to put my camera, I'm going to pretend I'm in Dallas, Texas. 
tell me what the eclipse will look like from Dallas, Texas. And in particular, I'm going to go to the Booker T. Washington High School parking lot. I'm going to go to the north corner of the Booker T. Parker, Booker T. Washington High School parking lot. What's the eclipse going to look like from there? And it's this. It's going to look like this, Mike. And these are the actual buildings in downtown Dallas. And you can see here, the uh, this is first contact. This is maximum. This is uh, maximum eclipse. And this is third contact. Uh, fourth. I'm sorry, first contact and fourth contact. So second and third and the maximum are right in here. And what's magnificent about this app is Dallas is flat. So it shows a more or less flat um, horizon. This is for a 16 millimeter uh, lens. 16, so if you vary the, sorry about that. If you vary the focal length, obviously this simulation will change, but it's just absolutely incredible how accurate this is as I'll demonstrate. But the key thing about this app is it gives you a simulated version of the image that you can, can expect to see. And it allows you to uh, see what happens if you change your camera location, if you change the focal length, if you change the orientation and that sort of thing. And so one big takeaway right now that I wanna share with you is this is a 16 millimeter lens, which is a fairly wide angle lens. And it barely captures the eclipse because as Suresh just said, the sun is so high up in the sky. And it's a challenging eclipse in that regard because it's the sun is so high in the sky and there's just no way to capture the eclipse along with a foreground using a 24 millimeter lens or a 35 millimeter lens or a 50 millimeter lens. To even contemplate that, you'd have to do a panorama. And I'm not sure that would be successful because there hopefully would be so much blue sky in between. It would be very hard to stitch the images. So I think we're either looking at a a 14 millimeter or a 16 millimeter or maybe a 20 millimeter i think even 20 millimeters it doesn't work very well um, but that's the sort of thing that you can nail down precisely with planet pro ahead of time the, again i want to stress it gives you the location exactly when to start shooting 12 23 p.m and 302 p.m that gives you this shot the focal length the orientation and the current position of the sun and the moon at whatever time you specify so it's just Built. Oh, this is a different, uh, this is for an Albuquerque for thing. There's just a lot of different information there. That shot there is what your image will look like. Um, and it's it's tremendous for, I, I've used this now for years and years and years, and it's spot on in accuracy and precision. So I can't say enough things about it. I'll be talking also about this at the uh, upcoming Night Photo Summit, in uh, which is an online conference that you may have heard about as well. So uh, if you are interested in learning more um, about an example of how to use this, this is a screenshot of a YouTube video I put together in my hotel room in uh, Farmington, New Mexico back in October to help people like yourselves learn how to use Planet Pro to plan an eclipse sequence. And if you scan that QR code right there or you go to my YouTube channel and dig around a little bit, I'm sure you'll be able to find this video and it will kind of walk you through how to use planet to do an eclipse sequence plan. So there's that. Uh, let's just do a comparison. So this is the planet pro plan for that total solar eclipse shot that I showed you a minute ago from Grand Tetons. And this is what the actual shot looked like. And as you can, I think you'd agree that it does an incredible job of capturing not only the objects in the night sky, but also the three-dimensional foreground. And this is using a 24 millimeter lens and a portrait orientation. And I mean, it, it's I've got dozens of these examples of uh, just extraordinary correlation between the, the simulation of planet and uh, uh, the actual event. Keep in mind that this was a project I was doing with Bob Akhtafreshi, who is uh, a National Geographic uh, nightscape photographer. And he and I were talking about this project and we planned it months and months in advance so that when we actually went out there, we knew exactly what to expect. Uh, here's this shot just to show you how it, how well it captures the foreground for that. And you can again see the um, the, the Grand Teton right here, the mountain right here, and then the, the mountain surrounding uh, Lake Solitude. But as I say, I've got dozens and dozens of these uh, instances. This is the annual eclipse from uh, New Mexico. And this is the, the type of thing that I was able to get here. So I'm certainly going to be uh, creating a plan for the projects we do in Texas uh, for the eclipse. And I'd encourage you to uh, consider 
learning a little bit about this um, app and how to use it for all, not only uh, eclipse planning for, you know, full moons, sunrises, sunset, moonrises, Milky Way, if I talk, it has the complete Messier catalog in there. So you can, if you want to have the Andromeda galaxy rising over, you know, a particular structure, you can find that and decide what focal length to use or the Rho Ophiuchus molecular cloud or, you know, the Lagoon Nebula, the Orion Nebula, any of those things, they're all you know, Sombrero Galaxy, if you wanted to try that one. But um looks like the chat is building in. So I'm going to go back to Suresh and see what's going yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah, I was just waiting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there are several questions and comments here. So Clayton, I, uh, at 222, he put in a link. I believe this is a cloud prediction uh, oh, good. for the path of totality. I think that's what he got off of Reddit. Uh, Don Gazdick posted a link to eclipsofile.com which is a really good Eclipse site for people Absolutely. that need information on, Excellent. on the Eclipse. Uh, Bruce McDonald, uh, my original question condensed, does the field of view in Stellarium match reality, especially for wide angle? Yeah, you know, it's every time I look at that, it's I haven't exhaustively tested it because I just use uh, Planet for that. So um, I, I don't think it's, ex I think you can get it to match exactly, but you have to kind of tinker a little bit and I haven't tinkered with it enough. I think it's possible. So Bruce, I, yeah. I use Sky Safari and I can I can tell you that matches. So um yeah. and I suspect Solarium is pretty close. Yeah, I um, I, I do too. I, I mean the version I just showed you I think was off because I haven't tinkered with it because I use Planet. But if you tinker with it, I'm sure you can get it to line up exactly. So I put four links in the chat, everyone, for useful sites. One of them is the eclipse.company, which has uh, eclipse maps, eclipsewise.com. Um, I put a link there and then I put two others, Eclipso file, which I think Don also put. And then time and date has an eclipse uh, page set up for this eclipse. So if, you, if you're traveling, you can go there and you can see a simulation on what the eclipse will look like for that site. Uh, Clayton mentions a comment here that he's heard travel in Texas may be difficult on, on the day of. So, uh, so move, moving to a better weather may be more difficult than one might expect. I expect a lot of people to be in Texas for this eclipse. Yeah. So the roads are probably going to be clogged. Yeah. So just be prepared for that. Yeah. Uh, John Renwick says that during the 2017 eclipse, there were thin high clouds. He pointed his camera at the horizon recorder, a nice video of the Umbra darkening the clouds as it oh. passed. And he's very happy about how he came out and he uh, it's on YouTube. John, if you want to post that link to your YouTube uh, 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 thing, that'd be great. Michael Cowper mentions he has an embarrassing failure. I have again failed again and again to successfully stack my high definition telescope eclipse photos to get high dynamic range or cool composite images. Therefore, I have moved to a Canon point and shoot super telly with built in 1350x telephoto zoom that works for him. It's not, not as sharp, but much easier to use. And the sun is easy to find. Uh, he sets infinity as focused to infinity and the sun fills the frame. So that's something he, he says has an option has a, uh, to make videos as well. So he's planning on using that. Alan Touchberry mentions that there's an article in the March Sky and Telescope that shows the solar filter for and a solar image from a sea star telescope. So somebody oh, has a nice. question about sea star, the ZWO right. sea star telescope. See the March issue Sky and Telescope pages 68 and 69. Uh, Myron mentions that for cloud images, I guess on game day, on Eclipse Day, you can go to Google's NASA GOES satellite uh, mm. website uh, to see uh, up to the minute whether uh, clouds. And then Kirby has the last comment. Uh, he likes Astronomy Magazine better than Sky and Telescope. That's what he wrote. So uh, are there any other questions or comments right now? All right. I'll bring you, leave it back to you, Mike. Well, I tell you, this is a this chat is going to be a treasure trove that I hope we all download and come back. This to is great time because we, this we is had fifty seven people start uh, at, uh, max, and we're still at fifty three, so people are still engaged. So okay, great work. Go. Well, let's uh, let's see if we can keep them because we're going to get into some pretty gritty stuff here in a minute. But uh, all I'm showing you here is a, a a page on my website that has these tutorials on the right, and these are the same tutorials that are actually built into the app because I collaborated with the the development team there to create these. Uh, you know, five minute, 10 minute uh, tutorials on how to use Planet because I was very active using it. And uh, so if you, ever, if you ever want more of Mike Shaw, you can go to the Planet Pro app and click on the little help button in the lower left-hand corner and you can uh, get more of that. All right, so 
<clears throat> excuse me, let's talk about Eclipse Day. And this, let's try to, we talked about all these different things. Let's try to pull everything together because it's a, it can seem a little overwhelming and it, it probably is at first, but you know, it's better now than in Texas on the morning of the day. So it's Eclipse Day. Let's talk about a telephoto day. Um, and then we'll have some time for, you know, demos and other things. So this is kind of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this is kind of what we're interested in in teasing out. We've got our our partial eclipse uh, phases under control. Excuse me. We've got the partial phases under control. You really want to like what's going to happen during uh, right before and right after totality. So what I've done here is this is a timeline. But instead of this, you know, hourly timeline, which goes from noon until three in the afternoon, this goes from 135 to 150. So this is a much more zoomed in timeline because this is where things start to happen. And we're going to spend the next several slides talking about all the things that are happening right now. So second, and I've rounded these off to the nearest minute. When you go to uh, your different Eclipse resources, you can find a finer granularity regarding the exact moment of second contact for your excuse me, precise uh, location. And I'd encourage you to do that. But for this for this uh, demo, I'm just going to say second contacts at 140, maximums at 142, and third contacts at 144, which is pretty close to what actually happens in uh, Dallas. All right. So what I am planning to do, and again, this is, um, you know, with regard to the potential eye damage that I think Joan mentioned, uh, I'm planning to remove my solar filter about a minute or so before second contact. And I'm going to reinstall the solar filter about a minute after third contact. We might want to do a little bit of research on this and maybe we'll take it off a little bit later and put it on a little bit earlier. <clears throat> but something maybe, you know, but something like this. What's going to happen then is these are the events that we can anticipate. And again, this is just kind of a crude summary or, or shorthand, but with the solar filter on, we're going to be capturing the partial phases, and that's about it. And again, this is with our telephoto lens. Once we take our telephoto, sorry, once we take our solo, <laughs> and I can't form words anymore, once we remove our solar filter before second contact is when we start capturing, is when we can capture the diamond ring effect. We can begin to start thinking about capturing the Bailey's beads, and also the prominences, which are those gorgeous pink um, uh, arcs of plasma that you can see projected against the, the darkness of space. Once totality begins, we can expect to uh, capture, we have the opportunity of observing and capturing the corona during the total eclipse. And then before the solar filter gets put back on, after the eclipse ends is when we see the diamond ring. I guess I should really put the diamond ring starting, ending at second contact and beginning. So I need to uh, kind of update that, looking at that more critically. But these are the different effects, events that are happening during the different phases of the eclipse. And when it comes to our exposure mode, like how are we going to use our camera, then um, the during the partial phases, we basically just blast away using our pre-selected ISO aperture and shutter speed that we got from that practice session we were just talking about where we looked at the sunspots. So the first part in the partial phases is pretty straightforward. You know, when it comes to looking for the diamond ring effect at the beginning part of totality, then you might want to use these settings that I've shown here. Once you get into, and this is with the solar filter that's now off. Once you get into maximum, um, into maximum um, uh, uh, totality, where we can see the corona, that's when I'm going to be bracketing. So I essentially go from an eight thousandth of a second to one second at one or two EV increments using the sh the bracketing capability of the camera. That's when I'm really using a continuous uh, shutter release mode using my shutter release cable. This is really why I want to have my shutter release cable uh, attached. And then once I start getting towards the um, uh, time when the, uh, the totality is coming to an end, I switch back to... Uh, uh, these settings to capture the uh, the prominences and the and the diamond rings. 
So with the intervalometer, this is what's happening with that. So during the partial phases, I basically am capturing images. I'm going to probably be capturing images every five seconds, maybe every 10 seconds, no more, no fewer than every 15 seconds. During the the interim, you know, the the, the transition from uh, right around second contact, I'm going to be shooting every two seconds. And then when I'm done with that, I'm going to shoot the uh, corona. I'm going to switch the intervalometer off and just do everything manually using my manual, um, uh, doing everything manually, basically, and then the reverse coming out. And so that's basically, so if I was to summarize this presentation with regards to telephoto shots, this would be the framework for my plan. When it comes to the actual times for doing these different things, that depends a lot on exactly where you will be. This is for Dallas, Texas. If you move, you know, 50 miles to the northwest or into the to the southwest or northeast, it's going to be different because the the shadow is moving. But in terms of just a general framework of things, uh, this is this sort of uh, captures, I think, the scope of uh, what we want to do. Let me go through this. It's much easier for the wide angle lens, and then we'll, we'll come back for questions. Oh, let me do one more thing. Um, so that's looking at it from that frame. Let's look at it. Let's go through uh, the end quickly. Let's go through the individual components of this. Um, sort of a, instead of horizontally, but from a vertical point of view. So uh, the first part, we have our solar filter on. We're capturing the partial phases. We're using our pre-selected settings, and we're shooting every five seconds. So that's what we're doing there. OK, we're coming up onto a second contact. Uh, we take off the solar filter. We switch the intervalometer every two seconds, put our exposure mode onto those settings, and that's what we expect to capture. We then uh, we're now in the maximum uh, eclipse, maximum totality. That we turn the intervalometer completely off. We switch our exposure mode to bracketing, and we hope to capture these, uh, you know, the the corona and the prominences, um, it, it, with the hopes of putting together a, a multi-image um, HDR composite. Then we have to start thinking about uh, turning our intervalometer back on, just shooting every two seconds, getting back into a mode where we're going to shoot the uh, partial phases. Then we put the solar filter back on. And we go back to shooting the partial phases with our pre-selected uh, settings at um, every five seconds. Let me go through the, <laughs> the wide angle version of this because it's a whole lot easier here. Here, um, oh, wait, okay. Uh, let, before I do that, let me, let me pause for questions. Let me see if there's any questions or comments on this. Mike, I don't see any new questions or comments just yet. If there are any, please uh, oh, put it in okay. the chat real quick. But I will mention one thing. Uh, that I noticed during the 2017 eclipse that, that it pertains to this. You have to remember that during the eclipse, the moon is moving from west to east across the face of the sun. And what will happen during totality is that the eastern side of the sun will be visible at the beginning of totality, but the rest of the sun will not be. So any prominences that are on the eastern limb of the sun will be visible but that you'll notice that over the totality, over those four minutes or so that we're going to get of totality, the moon's going to be moving west to east, west to east across the sun's surface uh, face. So those eastern prominences are going to start to fade out or get covered by the moon, mm. and the western side starts to come in. So just be ready for that uh, as you're as you're uh, planning your totality. Is there's two different sides to the sun that you'll be able to capture these prominences on and it'll diff the, the ability and time to do that will differ as you get through totality as the moon glides across the sun's face that is a pro Thanks. tip that was a yeah that i i i wasn't ready for that and then in the 2017 eclipse i noticed this uh just be ready for that's why it's important i think it was uh, nick that uh asked about using a mm -hmm. hydrogen alpha filter that's actually a great idea because it'll mm -hmm. give you a heads up as to where the prominences are. And so uh, you'll be ready. If there's no prominences on the west side, you don't have to worry about them. But if there are, you better you can you can plan ahead and be ready for them to come in. Uh, That's fantastic. That is a great, great tip, Suresh. All right, Mike, back to you. I don't okay. see any comments. Okay, okay. All right, so let's talk briefly about uh, this shot. Because uh, with a telephoto, we just you know have a star tracker. We line up the sun and the moon in the center of the field of view turn on the tracker and we do all that stuff I was just talking about. Here, we don't have a star tracker. So we just set our camera up on the tripod, put the solar filter on and start shooting. But the question is, when exactly do we do that? So if you look carefully, these are some Planet Pro simulations. And if you look carefully at these, what you'll see is that um, in this instance, 
the sequence starts right just here where I have my uh, my, uh, my 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 mouse, the arrow, and that starts at twelve twenty three, which is C one, and then ends at three o two, which is the full eclipse. So we've got the full eclipse sequence, but from a just an artistic point of view, that looks kind of, you know, incomplete in my opinion to have, you know, there's why did the sun just suddenly pop in here? And wouldn't it be nicer? I've I've included all of the images, so we're going to select from this. But if we had a complete sequence of uh, sun and moons filling the frame, going all the way across frame, at least to me, I think that would be a nicer looking um, image. And to get that, of course, on the image on the right, we're going to have to start almost an hour earlier, and we're going to end almost an hour later because we have to catch the moon when it first enters the frame, and then we have to wait for it to exit the frame before we stop shooting. And this is why this planning with Planet Pro is so helpful because it allows you to determine exactly when you know you want to actually start shooting and, and end shooting. So this is a close up of that uh, uh, of that image showing where C1, C2, and C3, and then C4 actually are. And what this shows is the image on the far left shows exactly when the sun and the moon first enters the frame. And that happens at 1124. So that's how you find that out. And you can scroll. This this bar on the bottom is a little timeline that you can scroll with your finger back and forth. And you can vary the time until you can see the sun and the moon just barely leave the frame at 355. So what we would do here then is we would um, make sure then that instead of... Uh, instead of waiting until 1223 to start shooting, we'd actually, I'd probably start shooting. No, actually I would wait until exactly, let me go into that. Okay, so what you would, what I would do then is at 1124 PM, well, the first thing I would do on the right, let me turn your attention to here, is like around 11 o'clock, I would get here probably like nine or nine o'clock in the morning or something, gets everything set up with my 16 millimeter lens. And then I would orient the, or arrange the composition so you see where it says, put the foreground height here, which is about a fifth of the frame height up. I'd frame the composition so that the buildings look like this and the, and the uh, foreground, as, as near as I can estimate, is about here. That gives me my vertical orientation. And then at 1124, I would rotate this, you know, horizontally, I'd pan left to right on the azimuth. And at 1124, I would rotate it until the sun just enters the frame. And I would start shooting at that moment. Once the sun starts shooting, I would just let it rip. And then um, uh, essentially wait until probably 4.15 when it's completely out of the frame before uh, turning it off. And of course, I'd remove the solar filter during totality and put it back on for the uh, end of it. So um, let's go through this version of this for that instance. So we have our... Wide angle shots, so we decided at, um, we, we installed the solar filter at 11, whatever it was, 1120 or so. We've taken our shots of the solar filter. Now with a wide angle lens, it's safer to remove the solar filter much earlier than for the telephoto. So I would take mine off about probably four to five minutes before second contact. Telephoto, it was more like a minute. And then I would shoot, um, I'm going to leave it off for this period. I'm going to talk about that and then put it on about four to five minutes after the third contact, much less critical with a wide angle uh, lens, you know, 16 millimeter in particular. In fact, you heard the person saying they're going to plan on shooting the whole thing without a, uh, with a, a fisheye. So that's, uh, that's that. Uh, this is what we're going to get is during the partial phases, we're going to have a whole bunch of um, suns just by themselves. During totality, we're going to have a whole bunch of images that looks like that, glorious. Make it, that's what that time lapse was that you can see the whole sequence of events. And then uh, we'll have to go back to partial phases for the final stages of the event. The, as far as an exposure mode goes, again, we just, for the partial phases, we use the predetermined ISO aperture and, and shutter speed. And then during the eclipse, uh, the totality, I just set my camera to aperture priority with a negative 1.7 EV compensation. Uh, that works well. I got that from Alan Dyer's book that I'll be describing in a minute and then uh, go back to the rest of it. And from the intervalometer, I just shoot five seconds during the partial phases and then just speed things up every two seconds during uh, totality. So that's how we get these three different types of shots from these three uh, cameras. The only difference between now the wide angle shots is just the orientation and the focal length, whoops. Um, 
post-processing uh it's coming up on the hour so um essentially in light in in photoshop the key thing i want to say is you take the different images that you have and you once you've got them oriented them correctly you and again this is being recorded so i'm, I'm going to just load this into the system for your later perusal um the uh what we do here is we've got our images that we want to combine our telephoto images file scripts load file into the stack we've done that we do this we can we have now have a new stack of images which only has we only see we can only see the top we can make sure we can see the layers we can't see that uh so now we have the stack of the images we want to combine but we only see the top layer but then we highlight all but the bottom layer and we choose the light and blend option now we can see all of them and then you simply use the move tool to pick a layer and then move it around until you have whatever uh, orientation that you like and then you just save that and then you can turn it into a smart object and crop it so i think i'm gonna um so recommendations enjoy the eclipse enjoy the eclipse it's a it's an incredible experience it's the pinnacle by all accounts, mine included, <laughs> for what it's worth, it's the pinnacle of astronomical events. I and mean, there's just nothing like it. Enjoy it. If you leave the lens cap on, you lose the focus, ah, you're in there. You're in total. If there's clouds and it gets dark, you're still there. It's all pretty cool. Uh, just be sure to check your focus and make sure your lens cap is off. I can't, I hope I remember to take mine off. Um, practice as much as you can. This is a dry run from my hotel room. This is a dress rehearsal from the hotel and my workshop. I get a lot of, this is a Starbucks. This is a Starbucks. This is a Verizon store in Farmington, New Mexico. There's no eclipse here at all, but we were just practicing, making sure everything was right. This is a dress rehearsal on the day. You know, everything, this is the day before the eclipse. There's a ton of things that can go wrong and just, uh, you know, just be aware of that and and and, and be smart. This is a book that you should get. Um, every time I've thought about writing a book on how to photograph the eclipse, I think about Alan's amazing book and it's just so valuable. Uh, it's only available as an ebook. You can bring it with you wherever you go and it has everything you could possibly want to know about how to photograph the eclipse. If you haven't yet picked up a copy of my new book, this is your opportunity to do that. Um, I am offering an online workshop on how to photograph the eclipse in uh, at the end of February, the beginning of March. It's already about half full, but there are some spots. And it's basically two nights, three hours per night. And because it's limited to only 16 people, we can actually have a lot of back and forth and I can help you develop your plan. You know, we're gonna be using Planet Pro a lot. You can learn all about that there. Uh, this is my website in case you haven't seen that before. But this is what we've covered today. I think by now you've been able to see a lot more about what goes into capturing these images. And I'm sure that you'll have a much uh, greater enjoyment of the process now that you know, if you didn't already, all the stuff that we've talked about. I hope that you have uh, clear skies where you go and you have a successful eclipse day. And I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, join in today. So I think we've got some couple minutes left for questions, but I'm gonna I'm going to leave it there for now. Mike, this is phenomenal. There's a bunch of comments in there that people really enjoyed this presentation. So thank you. Oh, good. There are a couple of comments in here. Um, first thing is, uh, Myron had mentioned that you can go to the NASA GOES satellite page for uh, tracking clouds on Eclipse Day, but I think he just sent it to me. So I, I reposted it to the group and I included the direct link to the GOES uh, East satellite page, which is the one that covers pretty much the entire Eclipse path. So you can go there. I put that link in there a few minutes ago. Nick mentions something about uh, PIP. PIP will center, center the sun if your alignment and tracking is off and you want a time lapse that isn't jumpy or drifting. I'm not sure what PIP is, though. Do you know what that is, Mike? No, that's a new one. Maybe we could elaborate uh, that. Nick can, you, Nick, can you chime in on what is PIP? Don says PIP is cool, and he said he includes a link to it. So apparently, okay. it's some kind of a software. It's a planet stacking program uh, for hmm. lunar, for, I guess for lunar work. So it's a planet stacking program that can be used for uh, stacking moon pictures. It works for the sun. So that's something that people can look at. And I think I'll get I'll finally get to 
uh, Bob McDonald's Bruce McDonald's question from one o'clock is his kind of technical question. He's going to be northwest of uh, San Antonio, and the altitude of the sun ranges from sixty to sixty-eight to sixty-two degrees during the eclipse. The azimuth of the sun ranges from one hundred thirty-four to two twenty-three. And the motion is about 90 degrees in two hours, 40 minutes. That will fit in the field of view of a 14 millimeter lens. During totality, five planets will be in the vicinity of the sun. Uh, four of those should be visible in photos of the corona. Stellarium shows that they will fit in the field of view of a 24 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. Uh, based on the azimuth and altitude of the planets, the horizontal separation between Jupiter and Mars will be a 116 degrees that will not fit in the field of view of a 14 millimeter lens is the field of view in stellium just wrong is it that far off he wants to, he's planning on using his 14 millimeter lens yeah so, i'm i'm trying to i'm going back to my talk where i talked about briefly about stellarium my quick answer on that would be uh to oh here we go so let's go back to uh zoom so mike while you while you're looking that up i did a little math on this ahead of time uh and so it looks like I don't think that those numbers are right, Bruce. As from what I see in Sky Safari, uh, Saturn and Mars will be about 36 degrees west of the sun, and Jupiter and Uranus will be uh, 31 degrees east of the sun. So if you add those two up, 31 and 36, that's about 66 degrees. And a 28 millimeter lens with a full frame camera, the field of view is 65 degrees. So you'll just cut off. Uranus, actually, but you can probably fit Jupiter pretty much all the way to Mars, uh, which is going to be west of Saturn, based on those numbers. If that answers your question, so with a fourteen millimeter lens, you should be you should be fine. It's not one hundred sixteen degrees; it's more like sixty six or sixty five degrees, something like that. Yeah, I, I will say, um, and I'm pulling up Stellarium right now, and I'm actually I'm not going to. I don't have time for that. So I'll just say um, that's exactly the sort of question that Planet is really good at uh, nailing down precisely because you enter in your um, sensor size for your type of camera, excuse me, and then you go through exactly what we we're just talking about. It's just perfect for that. Uh, Michael Copper makes a very useful comment. Batteries, <laughs> bring. Oh my gosh! Bring yeah. batteries. Bring batteries, yeah, please. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, lots and lots of batteries for Eclipse Day because stuff happens. And uh, memory cards. Yeah. And memory cards. Good point. Yeah. 